Hi friends, Krista here. Thanks for stopping by Books and Jams. It is finally time to tell you about my favorite reads from 2022. I have decided this year to make a list of 22 books. In the past, I have done different things. I've done a top 10. Last year, I think I made different videos for different genres. Today, I just decided I'm going to do 22 books for 2022. So these are my favorite books of the year. I did not rank them at all. I did not want to put that kind of pressure on myself. I did instead sort them into some categories in order to share them with you. So I have middle grade, nonfiction, historical fiction, and kind of contemporary. Yeah, I guess we'll call it contemporary. So let's just get started. The first category I'm going to talk about is middle grade. I have five middle grade books here to tell you about that stand out from the rest of all the middle grade that I read throughout the year. And I read quite a bit of middle grade. It's a pretty good chunk of my reading, but these five are spectacular. The first one is Cece's Journal by Doris Chamblain. This I believe is translated from the French and it's a graphic novel and it is easily my favorite graphic novel ever. And I'm gonna get a two for one here because I also want to talk about Cece's Journal Lost and Found which is the, the second book in this volume. There are five kind of short stories within these two volumes and we follow Cece who is a precocious 11 or 12 year old who has lost her dad before the story begins and is really kind of struggling with that grief. And that's kind of the overarching story throughout all, like her relationship with her mom and her friends is a little fraught at times. But Cece loves a good mystery. She loves a good mystery and she's always kind of looking for a mystery in the world around her. The first story in this book blew me away. The illustrations are stunning. If you don't like graphic novels, but you'd like to try one, I highly, highly recommend seeing if you can get your hands on Cece's Journal because it's fabulous. The next one is kind of hard to recommend because it is in a series. It's book six of the Keepers of the Lost Cities series by Shannon Messenger. I have been reading this series for quite a while with Amy's Bookish Life, and I love reading these with her. We have book nine to read, and then I think next year book 10 comes out or later this year maybe, and that I think will be the last one. So we're not rushing to read book nine, but this was book six, and book two, three, and six are still my standout faves amongst the eight that I've read so far, and I just really love this series. I love the growth of these kids, of Sophie, our main character, and her group of friends. I love that each of the side characters also has something that they're dealing with and have to work through. They each have their own character arc. I think Shannon Messenger does a great job of capturing these young teens now at the age where they are. So I'm just a huge, huge fan of this series. It is fantasy. We're dealing with elves and goblins and, and all kinds of creatures and magic, and I love it. I love it. I'm totally here for it. Going in a totally different direction is this historical fiction, A Place to Hang the Moon by Kate Elbis. Oh, what a lovely story this was. Oh man, we follow the sibling group of three kids who right at the beginning are at the funeral for their grandmother, who they did not have a great relationship with, but they are the last in their family and they're left a rather large inheritance. This takes place right at the time during World War II when in London, a lot of children were sent to live with families out in the countryside. So these three kids are tasked, if you will, by their lawyer to, to maybe try to find a family that might adopt them while they go out to the countryside. This is their opportunity to try to find their own family. Ultimately, they get placed in a couple different situations, which are not very easy, but does have a big swing up at the by the end of it. And I do love that all three of these kids love to read and they find solace in the library in the little town where they get placed and in the librarian. And it's just a lovely, lovely read. It almost reads like a classic, even though it just came out in 2021. It has kind of a timeless feel to it. I absolutely loved the sibling group. I loved the story. In 2022, this was my highest rated book, according to Goodreads. So with good reason, it's fantastic. I did pick up the 2022 Newbery winner, The Last Quintista by Donna Barba Higuera. And this is a sci-fi middle grade and I loved it. <laughs> Definitely focuses on the importance of story. We follow one young girl and her family who are chosen to get frozen ultimately on this ship because a huge meteor is coming to destroy the earth and certain people are chosen to go 
populate a new planet. And, and this young girl and her family, what's her name? Petra. And Petra and her family are chosen to do that. But along the way, some shenanigans happen on the ship. Petra is a middle grader <laughs> who doesn't necessarily want to walk in the footsteps of her parents, wants to kind of do her own thing. But she remembers all of these stories from her grandmother. And so a, a story is a huge part of this. But we're also in this kind of space situation and drama that happens on the ship. I really enjoyed this and I think it's a well-deserved Newbery winner. And my final middle grade book probably will not come as a surprise. This was my favorite read during middle grade March and it's a nonfiction and that is All 13 by Christina Soontornvat. This is the incredible cave rescue of the Thai boys soccer team. This is chronicling the events of what happened in 2018 when this soccer team from Thailand all went into this cave and then the rains started coming down and the, the caves flooded and they got trapped inside the cave and basically the whole world came around them to try to rescue these boys and it's called all 13 we do know it's history it happened they were all rescued but it was i was on the edge of my seat even though i knew they were all getting out the way that she wrote this had me captivated it also has a ton of pictures. It's set up almost like a textbook where there are these kind of separate sections where we learn a, a little bit more about Thai culture. It's incredible the amount of people that were involved in this cave rescue and Christina Suntormat put it together in just such a fabulous way. I highly highly recommend this book. It's fantastic. And since that is since that is nonfiction, we will move right into nonfiction. I just have three nonfiction that stand out to me this year. Uh, the first of them, I did a buddy read with Amanda from The Curly Reader and Lindsay, one of our, <laughs> Lindsay, one of um, our subscribers, and we read Under the Banner of Heaven by John Krakauer. This was my first John Krakauer, and it will not be my last. In this one, he takes kind of a deep dive into the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, the FLDS, and in particular, one event that happened where a group of brothers murder this girl is murdered and and these brothers are responsible for it and they are part of the FLDS church but they kind of are even off on their own philosophies and theologies but he goes all the way back to the beginning of Mormonism and Joseph Smith and kind of tells how this church grew this religion grew how these different groups of of the church kind of broke off with their own changed philosophies and theologies so it's part true crime part deep dive history into the Mormon church. I think that John Krakauer did it in a very accessible way. It was very interesting all the way through. I was fascinated <laughs> by a lot of what he told me in here and also very respectful. From reading this, I don't think John Krakauer comes necessarily from a Christian worldview, but I do think that he was very respectful in the way that he talked about the Mormon religion in here. And it was a fantastic read. I still need to finish watching the adaptation. The next nonfiction, I don't know where it is, is the library book by Susan Orlean. I just read this in November. It is so fascinating. Again, kind of in the similar vein to John Krakauer's book. It's part true crime and part deep dive history into the LA, the Los Angeles Central Library. And it definitely felt like a love story to libraries. The author highlighted how important libraries are in their community and in particular the LA Central Library in the, the location where it was. It went back through all of the different people who were in charge of the library, so a deep history into that. But also there was an event in the 1980s where there was a fire that destroyed tons of books and a good chunk of the library itself. And there's a bit of a mystery as far as how did that happen? Who started it? So we get to explore that that crime of the fire in the library, but also the history and importance of the library itself. It was so good. So good. And then the third nonfiction that I have is Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. This is a book that I did as a group read, a kind of larger group read on my channel where I invited a few other booktubers to participate in some lives with me and we broke it up into four sections and read this throughout the month, I believe of May. And it was fantastic. It definitely was very moving and encouraging. This one really takes a deep dive into the heart and the core of, of Jesus and who he is, not just the things that he's done and his life and the miracles and the things that we can see on the outside from his actions, but it really dives into the, the, the heart and the core of love that Jesus has for us. 
And it really was very moving and challenging and inspiring and encouraging and something I can see myself revisiting again and again. Loved, loved, loved. And I loved reading that with so many of you as well. Those Christian nonfiction group reads are coming back in 2023. They kind of took a little hiatus in the second half of 2022, but they're coming back. Next, I have some contemporary, but I do have one that doesn't seem to fit in any of my other categories. I should put it with historical, I guess, but I'm going to talk about The Other Bennett Sister by Janice Hadlow. I loved this book so much. It's not contemporary. It's not historical. Maybe it is historical in, in that it's set during the time of Pride and Prejudice, which we don't really have a time for, for that. It's not a classic. It's connected to the story of Pride and Prejudice because this is the story of Mary Bennett. So in the first half-ish of this book, we get events of Pride and Prejudice from Mary's perspective. And Mary is one of the sisters who doesn't get a lot of page time in Pride and Prejudice. And the page time that she gets is not very... Um, kind. <laughs> Mary is kind of bookish and awkward and doesn't really pick up on social cues according to Pride and Prejudice and its adaptations. But in this one we get to see a whole different side of Mary and in the second half of it we move beyond Pride and Prejudice story and we continue to follow Mary. And I just absolutely, absolutely fell in love with Mary Bennett <laughs> in this book. I loved it and if more Jane Austen related books could be along this vein, I would love them. This was not cheesy at all. And it kept the the heart or the vibes of Pride and Prejudice and just kind of flipped some of things on their head as we look at them from different eyes. Love, 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 love. It's so good. Okay, then the next ones I have are definitely contemporary. Um, one that I don't own is called Miss Bunkle's Book. This was a surprise, a total surprise. It's written by D.E. Stevenson. It was a patron pick for me this year. It was recommended by one of my patrons and I picked it out of the cup and had to read it. And I was not at first excited to read it because this is the cover. This is the cover that I saw first and I was like, oh man, what are you doing to me? But I read it and it was a total delight. It was a total delight. We follow Miss Bunkle who lives in this small town. We get to know a, quite a few of the characters or people who live in this small town. Miss Bunkle needs a little bit of extra cash so she decides to write a book as one does. It happens to get published. She writes a story about the people that she knows only she changes everybody's names and changes just a few things about them and then things from her book start happening. It's almost like self-fulfilling prophecy almost. They read it in the book and some of them don't realize at first that, it, that it's them but little romances that she picks up on that they don't realize themselves come true. Just different things from her book start happening around town and I just found myself smiling all the way through. It was a delight to read. So much so that I have since gone on to buy the rest of the books in this series. And it's one of the series that I hope to finish in 2023 because I just loved it so much. I loved it so much. Another one that I can't, that I own but can't find that fits in this contemporary category is The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot by Marianne Cronin. I cried. I love this book so much. I heard about this book from Amanda at the Curly Reader and she does not steer me wrong because I absolutely loved this story of Lenny and Margot. Both of them live on a terminal ward in a hospital so you know that they're both really not doing well. Margot is 83 years old and Lenny is just 17. So right away we first meet Lenny and she's really struggling as you can imagine at being 17 and having to live on a terminal ward. She's not particularly close with her her parents. Um, we get to see some of her conversations with the priest, uh, the father who who is the chaplain at the hospital, um, and some of her questions for him. And I loved those conversations and I thought he handled them so well. And then she comes across this art class that's happening in the hospital and she pairs up with Margot and together they decide they're going to create a piece of art for each of their 100 years and along with it they begin to tell each other stories of their lives. We get to know Margot who lived through World War II and her love story and life story and 
Lenny shares some of her personal story as well. It just was, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And I cried multiple times. I'm not going to lie. I cried pretty early on and I cried a couple times all the way through just because I'm an easy crier. First of all, if you've been watching for a while, you know that. But also it just was fabulous. The next one is a little tiny book and Every Morning the Way Home Gets Longer and Longer by Frederick Bachman. I listened to this in the car on my way to DC, which is not that far away. It's an hour and a half away and was a mistake because I got there and I just was weeping. But this is the story of three generations of, in a family, a grandfather, his son, and the grandson. And the grandfather has dementia and isn't doing well. And it just was beautiful and so moving. Frederick Bachman does it again does it again I had to put this Catherine Center on my on my favorites of the year this is the bodyguard this is definitely the most rom-com ish that Catherine Center has written that I've read so far in this one it's it's pretty light and fun but I loved the male character in here there's a, a female who works for a bodyguard company and she gets tasked to, to fake date this famous actor as he goes home to visit his family for a wedding or something along those lines and I love that kind of switch on the the female is the bodyguard he is such a, a nice person the ways that he sacrifices for his family that you learn as the book goes on I just thought was beautiful and he's kind and respectful and fu it was funny I I just I just loved it. Catherine Center is definitely a favorite of mine. Totally not funny. <laughs> I have two more contemporary. I need to move along a little faster. Dear Edward is a book that I read with my Patreon book club group. This is by Anne Napolitano. And I was a little intimidated by this. I'm not going to lie. Before I read it, for some reason, I was thinking this was going to be a lot more literary than it ended up being. But in it, we follow Edward, who is the sole survivor of a plane crash. He loses his whole family. And he's 12 years old. And he goes to live with his aunt and uncle. And it's just about him processing and learning how to deal with that grief. I just really loved this book. It sat with me for quite a while after reading it. I've said it before. I absolutely love books that do tackle the topic of grief. I know it's not for everybody, but it is such a universal experience. Grief is such a universal emotion. And everybody processes and, and works through it differently. I thought Anne Napolitano did a great job at capturing Edward at 12. And as he grew into his teenage years, I thought it was appropriate for the way he was thinking and talking. Sometimes when you have a child narrator or a child protagonist, they age them up and they, they say things that a 12-year-old would never say. But I would say Edward was pretty appropriately written. He felt 12 and 13, like as he got older. Um, yeah, I thought this was beautiful in a sad kind of way. <laughs> and then the last contemporary I have on this list is one that I read right in January last year. This was another book club pick for my Patreon. We read some good ones this year. All the Lonely People by Mike Gale. I heard about this first from the Currently Reading podcast. I haven't talked about it in quite a while, but I remember absolutely loving this. Our main character in here is Hubert Bird, and he lives on his own and he lives a pretty isolated life. But when his daughter calls him, who lives far away, he tells her all these stories of this active social life and these good friends that he has. He's basically made up this whole life for himself. And then his daughter says she's coming for a visit. And he's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> uh, so he has to make some friends. And so we get to meet some of the neighbors. It definitely has a found family aspect to it. And it's heartwarming and beautiful. Importance of connecting with others. Oh, it was so good. And the final category today is going to be historical fiction. This is my favorite. I mean, all of these have been my favorite. <laughs> I've loved so many books this year. But I would say that this is that historical fiction is my favorite genre. So it makes sense that I have seven books in this category to talk about. And whew, there were some good ones. There were some good ones. The only one that I don't own is Four Treasures of the Sky by Jenny something Zhang. This tells the story of a Chinese young woman. It starts in China. She gets separated from her parents. Her grandmother sends her to the big city. She pretends to be a boy, but then she gets captured and sent to the United States. And we learn of that whole process and what happens to her when she arrives here. We learn about America's poor relations with China. It was ridiculous, the, the laws that, that we made, preventing Chinese women from coming over in particular. They just wanted Chinese men to come so they could work in factories and basically be 
almost slave labor. So we get to see some of the American Chinese relations through the eyes and story of this one girl who comes over. It was harrowing and emotional. And I was very interested in the author's note, which there's a scene at the end that is very disturbing. And the da the author's dad was on a drive one time in Idaho, I think, and pulled over to read one of those historical markers on the road and learned about this event that was a true event that happens in the book. And that was the starting point for the author to write the story. He's, the dad called his daughter be like, you need to write this story. The dad called the daughter and was like, you need to write this story. <laughs> or here's a story idea for you. I forget which. But anyways, she took it and ran with it and told a lot of, of the story through the eyes of this one young woman. And it's heavy. It's it's difficult to read, but it was, it was beautiful and I loved it. That's Four Treasures of the Sky. Then I have six more here that I actually own. Um, I have an Amy Harmon book because... I feel like every time I read Amy Harmon, it's going to be on my favorites list. I absolutely love her. She has written a lot of different kinds of books, even fantasy and contemporary. But this is another of her historical fiction. And this one has some time travel in it. And it's taken. it takes place in Ireland. In particular, when Ireland had a civil war, because some people wanted to stick with England and the rest of the UK, and some didn't. And so that is a big part of this story. But there's a bit of a romance in there as well and a grandfather-granddaughter relationship that was beautiful. I just, every time Amy tells a story, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. She's a great storyteller. Another book that was a Patreon book club book was Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese. This is probably, th this might be one of the only ones that's not a five star. This was only four stars for me. Um, this takes place in Canada and we follow a young Ojibwe boy who ends up at an Indian training school, which were recently in the news horrible, the stories that we're hearing from how these um, indigenous children were treated in these schools. And this does not hold back from telling us some of those stories. Um, this is told from the perspective of Saul Indian Horse. We start the book later in his life and he's kind of almost writing out his story, his testimony, his confession. And so then we go back to when he was a child and and what happens. We get to see a, glimpses of his family and like snapshots almost, which makes sense. I felt like I was reading a memoir when I read this. It felt very real. It was very emotional, very poignant. A big chunk of this book deals with hockey. And and it, it <laughs> hockey was something that, that almost rescued Indian Horse from, from his life. But it also was something that was very difficult at times as well. Hockey is a huge part of this story, and I'm not a hockey person, but I could deal with it. There was a there was one or two parts that I'm like, okay, I'm done with the hockey. But looking at the thing, looking at the story and the book as a whole, I could see the importance of it for sure. So this was one that has stuck with me. I mean, I only read it in November, I believe, but I do feel like it's one that I'm going to think about and remember for a long time to come. Another kind of heavier hitting one. I just also recently read, and that's Yellow Wife by Sadiqa Johnson. Whew, a good chunk of this takes place right here in Virginia, actually right in Richmond. We follow this young biracial enslaved woman. The Her mother was a slave and her father was the, the master of the house. And the dad had promised that when Phoebe turned 18, she would be set free. But his wife was incredibly jealous and bitter woman and cruel, heartless. She was horrible. And while the, the master of the house and even and Phoebe's mom were away on a trip, Phoebe got sold off to a jailer who lived here in Richmond. And because of her light skin, she became his mistress and had some influence in the jail. And we learn about um, it was called like Devil's Half Acre or Hell's Half Acre or something that gel right here in Richmond. I believe you can go and see where the foundation of it was. With a, There's just, I think, a historical marker there right now. But whoa, I know Richmond was kind of a, a training spot, um, sadly, <laughs> for people. Um, enslaved people would be brought here and then sold to the highest bidder. It was an auction spot. Um, we have a, we have a, a hiking trail here called the slave trail that you can walk and and learn about the history of slavery here and right here in Richmond which is really difficult um and this book did not hold back again I 
was listening to it on audio as I was walking through stores and I would have to stop and and collect myself because it was very heavy and emotional but so well written I'm looking forward to her she has a new Sadiqa Johnson has a new book coming out in 2023 and I'm really looking forward to it because I loved I loved her writing <laughs> on a much lighter note <laughs> I have Dear Mrs. Bird by AJ Pierce I I wish there were more historical fiction like this where you still get to learn a bit of the history but there has a it has a lighter touch a lighter feel I feel like Guernsey Literary Potato Peel Pie Society is also along these lines there are parts in here that made me laugh out loud but this is World War II and we follow an aspiring journalist who becomes a secret advice giving columnist her mentor has one very particular way of doing things and she's kind of going against that on the sly <laughs> knowing that her mentor never really reads the column to begin with. I just found it to be at times humorous, at times filled with heart and a fun, different kind of look at a World War II historical fiction. Worth the read for sure. Just two more. Thank you for sticking in with me. <laughs> Next I have I Must Betray You by Ruta Sepetti. Uh, this is a YA set in Romania post World War II. So during the Cold War, in Romania at that time was very communist and run by dictators, Ceausescu and his wife. And this book captures the atmosphere of life in Romania at that time so well. You could feel the mistrust or distrust of everybody around you. Even in your own home, you didn't know if somebody was tasked to be a spy. People were constantly being asked to spy on their friends, neighbors, family. And we follow this young high school boy who is approached about spying on people in his life. And we find kind of follow how that affects him. Does he do it or not? There's a little bit of a, a beginnings of a rebellion stirring up. The The thing that I remember the most is the atmosphere of of mistrust and that intense lack of, of having anywhere that's a safe space. It was so well done. So well done. And this takes place in our in the 1980s. Yeah, I said post-World War II, but really it's like the 1980s. So it's not so distant past. Like this is in my lifetime. Final book on my list is Sparks Like Stars by Nadia Hashimi. I find that I really enjoy books set in Afghanistan. And this one in particular, I really loved. Our main character, Sitara, is just a child when this book starts. And her the Afghan that the the Afghanistan that she knows is beautiful and lush and her father works with the president and so she lives this life of getting to run around the president's house and then there is a coup and the communists come in <laughs> and take over her family is killed right in front of her eyes and she has to get evacuated and sent to the United States and the way that that happens is very spoilery I wouldn't I won't tell you how so she lives a good chunk of her life in the United States and we follow her difficulties in multiple foster homes and then as an adult she really wants to go back to Afghanistan she has she feels like she has some unfinished business and she wants to to visit her homeland again and the Afghanistan that she goes back to now that the Taliban is in charge is a very different country from what she knew as a child. To see that sharp contrast is through her through Satara's eyes was was very moving and I just loved this book. I thought it was beautifully written and this is another patron pick. I don't know that I would have picked this up had it not been for one of my Patreon members telling me about it. 2022 was a fantastic reading year. It was difficult to narrow it down to 22 even, but I did. And there you have it. You've just heard a lot about them. I would love to hear from you down below. If you haven't read any of these, that I spark your interest in picking any of them up. If you have read them, do you agree with my putting them on the favorites list for the year? What was one of your favorite reads of 2022? All these things and more. I love chatting with you down in the comments. Let's chat down there. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you stuck around for this whole video. I appreciate you very, very much. And I look forward to talking with you in another video very soon. Bye.